Hi there, welcome to Active Intelligence. I'm Aaron Ironside. I hope you'll spend the next half an hour or so with me as we take a look at topical social issues with a lot of balance and hopefully not a lot of bias. This one, of course, very close to home for me as the spokesperson of the successful Say Nope to Dope campaign as we look at cannabis gone wild in Colorado on Active Intelligence. On today's episode, I caught up with a former U.S. attorney, Bob Troyer, from Colorado and find out whether there's any buyer's remorse a few years in to legalization and the industry going wild. Well, first of all, let's take a look at what life is like in Colorado after legalization, a much more laissez-faire version than was being proposed in New Zealand, an example of what happens when commercialization wins the day and suddenly there are cannabis shops all over the state. Here in the capital of Colorado, in the stop and go hustle of the big city traffic, you know something has hit mainstream when the local newspaper, besides the big headlines and weather, has a cannabis critic. So biodiesel, you're going to be looking for big fuel notes, uh, also a little bit of skunkiness to it, and then a slight sweetness if you pinch it. Hmm. Jamie Brown was thinking about being a lawyer. Now he smokes dope two or three times a week and gets paid for his opinion. Maybe good for like when you get off work. You know, you're looking for something that's not necessarily going to keep you up all night, uh, but still packs a decent You're punch. into this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I and mean, you have to be, right? <laughs> and this is where any adult 21 or older can come to buy pot. Is there anything else that you'd like to see? No, I'm good, thanks. Marijuana with names like Boston Blue Dream, HP 13, and Lemon Diesel. Or pot cookies, creams, pipes, t-shirts. All available in the historic Baker District of Denver. And they're busy. It can be one right after another all day long. This new cannabis culture, you know, instead of where it always kind of was tied to, you know, VW buses in the 60s, there's very much people owning this new marijuana culture. Yeah, yeah. Over 60 marijuana outlets in Denver alone, an estimated billion dollars in sales. Selling a little pot has quickly become big business. Cannabis gone wild in Colorado. And of course, it opened up Pandora's box. The sky didn't fall. It never happens like that. When people say the sky didn't fall, you should remind them it never does. That's not the issue. The issue is the issues that begin to emerge as a result of these kinds of moves like legalization. For example, Colorado has really struggled to address the issue of high potency products found in edibles. One of the stickiest issues for Colorado has been the regulation of marijuana edibles. Opponents of the edibles market are concerned about how products can be clearly demarcated as having marijuana once they are out of their original packaging. The candies, the cookies, the gummy bears, the sodas. I just can't understand why are we putting marijuana in so many different products that kids like. The edibles industry has maintained that it is overly expensive and unnecessary to add on product markets. As with many other issues related to legalization, the state has convened a work group, interested parties who provide recommendations to legislators to aid them in writing any potential new laws. In uh, the Constitution, we defined marijuana. Edible products are uh, part of that definition of what a marijuana product is. Therefore, any recommendation to prohibit any category of edible products is likely unconstitutional. If you have items once outside of the original package that are no longer identifiable to an adult or a child, you have a serious set of health and safety and enforcement risks. If we were to say you had to mark a product, mm -hmm. what we have to identify what that means. This is about marking the product itself. There's technology that can be used um, that I frankly don't think people have really reached out to and looked at. In my opinion, no matter what we put on them, accidental ingestion by children is going to happen if the parents leave them in the reach of their children. 
Well, we shouldn't really be surprised, should we, that edible products are really very confusing for children. They see a cookie, they see a brownie, they see a gummy bear, and they think that's food. And uh, even in places like Canada, for example, just recently, we've heard new stats saying that the admission rate for children to the emergency department for having ingested edible cannabis products has gone up by 400%. So edibles are a huge concern. Of course, it didn't start with edibles, it didn't start with recreational cannabis in Colorado, it started with a medicinal program, and even those charged with looking after that are concerned about a couple of things. Is cannabis, a medicinal cannabis products, even that useful, that helpful for those who are suffering? And what about those who are giving the medical advice around medicinal cannabis products, as Dr. Ken Finn explains? My premise is that I, I think it's, it's critical that we study uh, and, and, and prove the science without any, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it works or does not work in whatever condition. We want to be able to start breeding towards ailments, breeding for depression, uh, breeding for epilepsy, uh, breeding for stress or dystonia. We're currently working with doctors to educate our bun tenders to understand different things. We need to prove or disprove what benefit and what condition, because what I'm seeing in my office is people coming in smoking weed, hurting a lot and wanting me to prescribe all their narcotics. There is scientific evidence of a system that does work in our bodies and that's where THC works on, uh, but the effects are variable and can vary from person to person um, and some can be detrimental. The person behind the counter for medical marijuana, the criteria, the only criteria is you have to be 18 years of age and have a pulse. You have to have no medical background or training whatsoever. If you are going to be recommending this for a patient, shouldn't you have um, informed consent? That's Dr. Ken Finn pointing out, of course, that if you go to a pharmacy and you want to buy things like Voltaren, you have to talk to the pharmacist, a trained professional. But when you go to the cannabis dispensary in Colorado, you just meet some 18-year-old making some money to get them through uni. They know nothing about anything medical, and they're supposed to give you sound medical advice. That's not exactly a good system. Those who advocated, of course, for the legalization of cannabis said, this is the way to destroy the black market. Well, that's not exactly what's happened in Colorado. It is becoming almost routine across much of the country. Law enforcement intercepting Colorado marijuana products being exported to other states. In this case, a traffic stop in Tennessee netted 100 pounds of processed pot worth tens of thousands of dollars. In Indiana, it was a lettuce truck headed from Colorado to Florida with a load of marijuana. In South Carolina, it came through the mail. And across Colorado, raids on illegal marijuana grow operations have increased in both rural and metropolitan areas as law enforcement tries to keep up with the burgeoning black market. When Colorado voters approved legalization of marijuana, no one imagined such an opportunity to cash in on illegally grown pot. Yeah, I think one of the mistakes that was made in Colorado and some other states was allowing for you know, home cultivation. You know, and what we're seeing right now is a lot of cleanup from mistakes that have been made. I had never been in an indoor marijuana grow. I had heard about them. Kevin Merrill, the former agent in charge of Colorado's Office of the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration, agrees. When he first arrived in Denver as a federal drug enforcement agent in 2001, large illegal marijuana grows weren't even on the radar. Most of those that I had even heard about really involved, you know, a couple of individuals trying to make some product for themselves and then sell whatever extra they had uh, to fund their operation. It was a very small mom and pop or operation. But when it became legal for individuals to grow both medical and recreational marijuana in Colorado, federal law enforcement officials say criminal organizations saw an opportunity to illegally grow marijuana in plain sight in residential neighborhoods. What is this? Oh my God. Perched at the front window of her mom's Firestone, Colorado home last year. Look at all the police cars. Angie Wright and her mother witnessed a raid in this suburban subdivision north of Denver. It was just, holy cow. Yeah. Something major is going on. Law enforcement officers rolled in and started banging on doors. Oh my God, they're everywhere. I thought maybe it was just the house next door. Oh, they're going in the backyard of that house in the corner. To find out it was as many homes, I had, neither one of us had any idea. Again, no great surprises that once you told people that they could grow cannabis at home, the black market saw an opportunity to pounce on. And of course, the black market is now out of control in Colorado. This has not fixed the problem. It's just created 
a new set of problems. And that's why those who would normally be advocates for legalization, like Democratic politicians and lawyers like US Attorney Bob Troyer, should have been for the legalization of cannabis. But he has certainly had a change of heart. And I caught up with Bob Troyer. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Well, it's not very often that I get to speak to a former US attorney from the state of Colorado, let alone one from one would imagine on terms of the legalization of cannabis, the wrong side of the house, a Democrat. You're supposed to be for the legalization of cannabis. Have you always been against or has this been a change of heart for you? Uh, it was a it was a change of heart based on my experience as U.S. attorney. Um, I, like most people, uh, was confused by the industry rhetoric early on that blurs the difference between decriminalization and commercialization. So I've never had a problem with decriminalization, but uh, uh, did not have like like everybody didn't have any experience with commercialization. And uh, luckily, from my vantage point as U.S. attorney, I saw so many of the impacts and the harms right out of the box here in Colorado that I didn't uh, do what a lot of Democrats did and take it as an article of faith that you're supposed to be supporting the marijuana industry. Well, let's talk about the difference between what was hoped for and what eventuated. What were you thinking would be the the benefit if cannabis had been decriminalized as you had imagined that would go versus how things have actually turned out? Well, that's a great question. Um, the the No one, frankly, in law enforcement was paying a lot of attention to it because we were the first state to commercialize. And so no one had any experience with it. Uh, and uh, we were told uh, in all of the uh, all of the pro pot uh, sort of media and advertising and political lobbying uh, that this was really about social justice and decriminalization, um, and that it was going to provide a lot of money for schools and other public benefits, uh, including treatment that uh, that would make it well worth the experiment. Um, and so, to the extent. I mean, I voted against it, but to the extent anyone in law enforcement is really thinking about it much, uh, there wasn't a lot of mobilization and there wasn't a lot of thought about what we could really expect uh, because it just had not ever been seen before. So it was, it was very quickly entirely different from loads of revenue and low impact on communities. It was the opposite. We, we know there's lots of harms have increased. We'll talk about those today. But you mentioned a couple of the supposed benefits, the social justice one, that perhaps those from more marginalized communities would stop being unfairly targeted for their cannabis use. And of course, the hope that somehow tax money generated from the sale of cannabis might be used to support those who are struggling with cannabis addiction. Did either of those supposed benefits turn out at all? Not at all. Um... In fact, they both turned out to be um, detriments. The communities of color in Colorado have suffered more than the other communities, both in terms of uh, the density of dispensaries in their neighborhoods, uh, the, actually the expansion of a street level black market, which can undercut the, the legal market. That led to increased arrests actually, and, and marijuana violations uh, and arrests in communities of color actually increased. And they were marginalized uh, from participating in the industry. There was nothing built into the system that gave them any kind of advantage uh, to participate on equal footing with the rich white men, about a dozen of whom really are the dominant players in Colorado, who immediately uh, monopolize the industry and excluded people of color. Do you feel in some sense that there's some naivety at play here? Because if we had really sat down and thought, will big business care about ordinary people? We don't see hardly any evidence of that in any other industry. We know that in a sense, uh, big commercial enterprises, corporations don't have a soul. Uh, no, that's true. I was hoping you were going to tell me they did in New Zealand because I was going to move there. I'm looking for a place to move. Uh, but 
I'm, I'm disheartened to hear that's true in New Zealand as well as America. Um, no, that wasn't, that didn't uh, surprise anyone, I don't think, as the industry really took flight. Uh, but there really wasn't an industry before Colorado and the state of Washington started this. So nobody realized it would be an industry. I think people visualized um, small, discreet, uh, you know, mom and pop kind of dispensaries where hippies were growing flowers and, uh, you know, plants and peace and love. Uh, and uh, fewer people were going to be thrown in jail, and we were all going to have beautiful schools and parks and revenue available to treat people with other drug disorders. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think people who had thought it through, and that was not me at the time, and it was not almost any voters I ever heard from, uh, would have been able to predict we're going to have Altria, we're going to have Molson cores. We're going to have all of the big tobacco, big alcohol, other addiction industry players get in on this quickly uh, and expand it so quickly it excludes mom and pops. It excludes communities of color, ownership and economic opportunity for communities of color. And frankly, it, it's become so overwhelming, it's going to exclude regulation. People are going to be uh, so blindsided by this, it's going to be too late to stop it. And that's kind of what happened. Talk to me about THC levels. As you know, I was the spokesperson for the successful no campaign for the referendum on this topic here in New Zealand. And one of the issues that we were greatly concerned about was the difference between, in our instance, firstly, the, the street THC level, far higher than what was going to be proposed in terms of the cap. And yet, Without a cap in an unregulated market, THC has gotten incredibly out of control, unbelievably so. I mean, just how dangerous, how high is the THC in Colorado now? Oh, the THC in, in edible products and, and air in these products, um, when I say edible, <laughs> I'm talking about products you can eat, you can vaporize, and you can put in your body in the form of suppositories. Uh, which have uh, uh, commonly now, but commonly now in any dispensary, 95 to 99 percent THC. So, as you know from your successful work and your your research in the area and your advocacy, uh, there's very little testing of any of any THC level uh, product over about 27 percent, and a lot of studies that say 15 and over is dangerous in terms of psychosis, anxiety, depression, et cetera. Uh, and we're talking about the, the, the fastest growing and most profitable share of the market is in this concentrate sector, which has gotten very quickly into the upper 90s. And, and commonly, I think the average uh, product with concentrates in Colorado now is in the mid 70%. Well, that's incredible. And of course, now the challenge for Colorado is to, to set a cap. But the problem with setting a cap, of course, is that it empowers the black market. So will a cap work? Can, can the genie be put back in the bottle? I, I think the genie has to be put. I think it can. I think it can be put back in incrementally by educating people. Uh, by people like uh, like you and your country standing up and having the courage to educate people and make responsible decisions for the health and safety benefit of the community. When we start getting, we, we have the data and we, we get people to start digesting it, we get more and more people concerned about those impacts. I think the genie will go back in the bottle incrementally. Uh, and uh, I, I think it has to start with a cap. Uh, you know, uh, the industry is a little bit like uh, the National Rifle Association in the United States. They've been very good at turning everything into an opportunity, scaring politicians into thinking they can be voted out of office if they don't support the agenda, and dictating the terms on which they can be opposed. So 
we're go we're going to run you out of office if you try to ban assault rifles. But you can nibble around the edges, maybe with a uh, size of a gun magazine or regulating something tiny around the edges. That's what the pot industry does. And, and so I think it is important to get a larger ticket item like potency regulation to at least put a marker down uh, that we're going to start trying to put some of the genie back in the bottle. Here in New Zealand during the campaign, we were told that a vote against legalization was a vote for the gangs. It was a vote for the black market, that somehow legalization would destroy the black market. Did it happen in Colorado? Has the black market gone away? You know, uh, no. And uh, that argument, <laughs> I, it's hard for me not to laugh at that because uh, it, it's just the polar opposite of the reality we experienced in Colorado. What we found is that the sophisticated uh, transnational drug trafficking organizations actually were very well prepared and poised to come to Colorado to do business because they knew what an opportunity it would create to, to be operating in a theater where marijuana was normalized. So an interesting story about that, Aaron, we did a case against a Sinaloan cartel that was planting, you know, tens of thousands of plants on public land, forested land in Colorado. And when we debriefed one of the defendants, one of these Mexican cartel members, uh, we asked him, why are you in Colorado? Uh, and he said, Colorado's a, a magnet for organizations like mine. We're a business. We're minimizing risk and maximizing profit. There are five links in the chain to this business. We have to find a site. We have to grow the product. We have to cultivate we have to plant the product. We have to cultivate the product. We have to harvest the product. We have to get the product to market. He said in Colorado, there's no risk on the first three links of that chain because everybody thinks you have a license. Everybody thinks it's normal. We can do all that stuff that's usually risky in plain sight. And that, and, and I think they, it happened so fast. Our sense was that those organizations were watching the legalization effort. And when it passed, they were here immediately. Well, perhaps our biggest reason that we defeated the bid for legalization was we were able to, I think, really convince many parents that it seemed unlikely that the adolescent use of cannabis would go down after legalization. We were told, though, in the campaign, from the opposition all the time, that it just wasn't true, that, that youth rates didn't really go up, that it wasn't really a big deal, and that nothing much would change after legalization. But some of the facts and stats that I'm reading out of Colorado suggest a very different story. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. And we're glad to provide uh, through our suffering some facts and stats you can benefit from in New Zealand. And I'm actually serious about that. I'm glad people like you have taken up uh, the charge using some of the lessons we've learned here. Uh, look, the use in Colorado, the marijuana use in Colorado is 85% higher than the national average in the United States. Uh, one out of five high school students in Colorado is now a drug user. 21% uh, of our youth suicides, the suicide victim has marijuana in his system. Uh, the use, the youth use has skyrocketed and, and it's in part because of the concentrates and the ease with which they can avoid detection in using the products. I mean, we have, um, we saw almost immediately in the market, things like highlighter pens, uh, eyeliner pens, little things that kids would commonly have in their backpack at school or their purse, uh, that were vape, vaping devices. Uh, that would allow without any odor or smoke, you know, the extraordinary high of high potency THC during class. And uh, so it was not a surprise to any of us to see those numbers coming up, but um, it's, a, it's a big problem. And it's a big problem for these kids while their brains are still developing. 
You've said that you're quite happy that places like New Zealand sort of took the hint from Colorado. But why do American states not taking the hint? We're seeing more and more states adopting this legalization, commercialization model. Why are they not learning from the Colorado experience? I think, I think the answer to that, Aaron, is it uh, has been since President Nixon. It has been an article of faith in the Democratic Party to be pro-marijuana or at least for decriminalization of marijuana. And uh, the social justice issues and the mass incarceration issues and all those things that surround that issue uh, make it very appealing to Democrats and make it very hard for Democratic politicians to take even a reasoned, balanced public safety uh, approach to marijuana. And so those those elected officials and policymakers got uh, got co-opted very quickly by the industry. I think before they had, you know, in fairness, before they had the data, before they had weighed, you know, the health risks, really looked at the science. And, uh, you know, a lot of our politicians here in the United States talk about commercialization as a great experiment in democracy. And uh, no one, no one that I know of stopped to say at the time, who are the lab rats in this experiment? And it turns out the lab rats are our 12 to 20 year old children. You've mentioned that politicians uh, are kind of governed by an age old ideology. We know the campaigners the, the whole industry has its motive for convincing people to vote for this. And so they are kind of winning this battle. If Colorado was to go uh, down this road again, so to speak, would people vote the same way? Has, has the mood changed in Colorado or have people just decided, you know what, this is just the way it is? Uh, the mood has changed. I don't think it would pass. I, I meet people, uh, except for people literally who make money in the industry, uh, I meet people all the time that, who know how I feel about this because I spoke about it when I was U.S. attorney and I've been very public about it, who say in private, I had no idea what I was voting for. I voted for it. I shouldn't have voted for it. And, and it's a surprising breadth of people for a surprising number of reasons. It was no big deal. I, you know, I hate Richard Nixon. I, you know. Uh, I think we should be a more forgiving, balanced, more racially just society. I think we need money for schools, whatever. They swallowed, as, as, as you would expect, uh, most of the stuff coming from the industry because no one had any data or experience with it. So I don't think it would pass uh, if it were presented again. Um, that said, it, it still has got normalized. I mean, we all in Colorado have gotten used to making all kinds of accommodations to the existence of this industry, which is a very dominant presence now in our major in our several major cities here, uh, you smell it, you see the increase in homelessness, uh, trash. You see dispensaries everywhere. We have more dispensaries in our state for marijuana than we have McDonald's and Starbucks combined, um, and you see um, uh, lots more crime. Lots more property crime, petty theft, uh, more violent crime, and people uh, sort of accommodate that and just work around it and to some extent have accepted it as uh, a fact of life in Colorado. Uh, if, if they had a chance to vote, however, I think it would be a very, very different result. Bob Troyer, the former U.S. attorney, with what we can only describe as some buyer's remorse about legalization in Colorado. Now, here's the thing. We know that uh, the genie is out of the bottle. And so I asked him if they'd have preferred decriminalization. And he said, well, yes, compared to legalization. But for you and I in New Zealand, of course, the answer is, is decriminalization better than the status quo? So if you haven't really 
heard it or understood it, we changed the Misuse of Drugs Act back in 2019 to write into law the policing policy that said if you get caught with a joint, you don't go to jail, you don't get a criminal conviction, you get referred to health services. And what we do know from all the overseas experiences is this. It isn't law changes that change the reality of cannabis use and its associated problems. It's around education, it's around health. It's not around law changes. So there's no point decriminalizing unless you're going to put a whole bunch of money into making sure that people get the help they need to get off the stuff in the first place. And that's where we need to put our focus. Let's stop talking about law change. It's not the thing that's going to fix things. It's changing the way we use our resources to help those who are struggling with drug addiction. We use our education programs to hopefully reduce some of the demand. And of course, our police have to keep uh, vigilant to try to keep some control over a black market, of course, who don't mind what model you choose because they're not going anywhere. Love to hear your thoughts about today's episode. Why don't you subscribe, communicate, send us your thoughts at activeintelligence.nz. That's the website. Do hit that subscribe button so that we can send you every episode directly into your inbox. Thanks for watching Active Intelligence.